You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Folks, I just received from email, that's electronic mail over the internet, from a friend of mine who has just disclosed that his wife is threatening to leave him <laughs> if he doesn't stop uh, playing the intro to this broadcast at uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It seems that he's been staying up late at night replaying old broadcasts of the hour of the time, and uh, he doesn't have any headphones. And instead of winding into the program, he's playing every hour on the hour, she says, she can hear the barking dogs and the wailing sirens and the stamping feet of the Nazi jackbooted thugs as they go about their business. And uh, <laughs> I can certainly understand her position. I've been doing this broadcast for years, thousands of broadcasts now, and uh, um, I tell you, it, it, I refuse to get rid of that opening because it's a warning. It's how things are going to be if we don't wake up and stop it now. And uh, it's almost too late, folks. It really is. Uh, that is to prevent bloodshed. Um, it, it, you know, it can keep getting worse until eventually... The American people, as they always have, when tyrants uh, try to uh, take their freedoms, will just rise up with gun in hand and, and restore constitutional Republican government. The purpose of this broadcast has always been to prevent that. You see, my theory was, when I began this, was that if I could just wake up enough people and educate them to what is going on, then not one single drop of blood would ever have to be shed by anybody. And I always thought that that was a noble effort, that that was something worth doing. But, and, and uh, <laughs> I have succeeded in awaking millions of people, literally millions of people who had no clue, who are now awake and battling against the coming tyranny. There are still an awful lot of people out there who have never understood what's happening. They know something's wrong. Everyone does. Everyone can feel that something is wrong in their gut. I don't believe that there's anybody out there who, who, who doesn't feel that. At least no one that I've met. These people have just not been given the opportunity to have someone sit down and show the documentation and explain to them what's been happening over the years. And so we continue to try. And One of the things that I use is the opening to this broadcast because it is an attention getter. And uh, when I was on WWCR, which was a loud, clear signal that was broadcast all around the world, a lot of people just drifting through the shortwave frequencies were captured when they heard of that sound. So, while, while I certainly understand her concern, having to listen to that through the night, and I, I, I've advised my friend, don't do that at night. You know, do it sometime when, uh, when she's not trying to sleep. Or go down and spend $20 for a set of headphones. But, uh, <clears throat> we will... Keep it. It was suggested that I get a new intro to the broadcast. I can't do that. It's, this, is, this fits. Fits perfectly. And it tells it like it is. 
Now, uh, don't go away. I'll be right back with a whole bunch of stuff that you're going to find terribly interesting if you care about the United States of America, if you care about living in freedom. Well, folks, I have my copy of the Constitution for the United States of America here. I always carry a copy. I have my cup of jasmine tea that Annie has so graciously prepared for me so that my throat will not get dry during this broadcast. I have my computer here in front of me so that I can access information all over the world. And uh, a telephone here at my left hand in case I need to call someone. And stacks and stacks and stacks, reams, literally reams of paper that come in through the mail from all of our associates and members worldwide who send in information that you'll never see on the 6 o'clock news. We document it, investigate it. We spend time here going through it and analyzing it. And uh, a whole bunch of other things. We have, of course, our library, which at the current time is packed away in boxes and storage because we don't have a place to put it, but it rivals any, <laughs> any library in the world for the subject matter that it covers. And uh, those of you who visited the library when we had our research center in the old drugstore in St. John's know that that's true. Now, I have access to information, ladies and gentlemen, that you will never see in your whole life have access to information that is suppressed, that you will never hear or see on the 6 o'clock news by Dan Rather Not, the talking head that gets paid $2 million a year just to, just to keep <laughs> from telling you the truth. Haven't you ever wondered why these guys get such a big salary for sitting in front of a television camera looking pretty and not sweating on their collar and reading from a teleprompter something that someone else wrote? It's to keep them from all of a sudden in the middle of a news broadcast telling you what's really on their minds or what they may know to be the truth that is not being told or from just flat telling you that what they are being told to tell you in exchange for their salary is just a flat out lie. There are a lot of things going on all the time, folks. Taking us farther and farther away from freedom and into a one-world totalitarian socialist government. How many of you have heard the lie that's being spouted on television right now that the latest polls favor Clinton's performance 69%? 69% of the American people favor... William Jefferson Clinton's performance as President of the United States of America and don't feel bothered by any of the scandals that has, have plagued his presidency? How many of you have seen the questions that were asked on the poll? Were you aware that nowhere on the poll does it even mention President Clinton, his administration? The word Democrat does not appear anywhere. Do you know what people were asked in order to get that 69%? <laughs> 
Do you think things are going well in your personal life? 69% of the American people answered that yes. Not their public life, not their business life, not their job, their personal life. 69% of the American people answered yes. And uh, they have now lied to you. They've taken that 69% and they say that reflects that 69% of the American people are satisfied or believe that President William Jefferson Clinton is doing a good job and that these scandals do not affect his presidency. You see how easy it is to create a poll and then twist the answer to reflect a meaning that was not intended by the respondents of the poll, nor was the question even asked. Well, if you don't believe me, folks, do what I did. Get on the Internet, get a copy of the poll, and find out for yourself. It's there for the asking. And I believe that uh, CNN actually reported that fact. <laughs> Much to my surprise. They only did it once, and then didn't do it again. But they did report it once. Now, that's amazing, because the communist news networks normally don't tip the hand as to how they're manipulating it. How many of you knew that Hillary Clinton has joined the ranks of the loony fringe element paranoids in this country? That's right. Hillary Rodham Clinton has joined the ranks of those loony fringe element paranoids who think someone is always out to get them. In a startling announcement, she declared herself to be a conspiracy theorist. Can you imagine that? Hillary Clinton, on a major network morning program on January the 27th, claimed that the allegations of sexual misconduct against President Clinton and the allegations that he coached Monica Lewinsky to lie about it are the fruits of a vast right-wing conspiracy. <laughs> Hillary theorized, folks, that those names involved in putting forth the allegations against her husband are right-wing have popped up in similar situations in the past and therefore constitute a right-wing conspiracy against her husband. And, of course, her. She used the word we a lot, as if she's the president or half-president. <laughs> the fact, folks, that it has been President Clinton and Hillary who have condemned all conspiracy theory as being the manifestation of right-wing paranoia makes this a most remarkable development. In the aftermath of the Waco massacre and the Oklahoma City bombing, the President and Hillary Clinton labeled conspiracy theorists, and I quote, paranoid, right-wing, extremist, fundamentalist, and white supremacist, end quote. The press echoed the Clinton's statements and urged the American people to ignore conspiracy theories because they, quote, are the product of the paranoid and twisted minds of right-wing extremists, end quote. Isn't it funny that before Democrats came to power in the White House, all the conspiracy theory in the country was left-wing conspiracy theories against the Republican presidency? <laughs> uh, this just, you know, I find this extremely humorous. And there's, you know, a question comes out of this that we should be asking. Does this make Hillary Clinton a paranoid, right-wing, extremist, fundamentalist, white supremacist with a twisted, paranoid mind whom the public should ignore? Well, according to the definition of conspiracy theorist put forth by the liberal press and the Clintons themselves over the last several years, that, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what she is. <laughs> and it is exactly what we should do. So, <laughs> let's just ignore Hillary Oh, but you know what? You know what? I started to ignore her, and I found I couldn't because, guess what, folks? She's right. Hillary Clinton is right. Oh, you say, has Bill lost his mind? No, I haven't lost my mind, folks. She's right. The power behind the sex and lies scandal has been exposed by the Veritas News Service. That's our organization, folks. We were the first ones who broke the story. 
We broke the story before anybody else even thought about it. On February the 1st, we broke the story. And the people who live in the Round Valley of Arizona have already heard this, the ones who listen to 101.1 FM. Our sources, and we have many within the United States military intelligence community, folks, many of them are still loyal to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and help us out tremendously. Well, they have revealed that President Clinton has not only angered the Council on Foreign Relations by totally screwing the Bush coalition, but he has seriously affronted the British Israelites and international Zionism. And that, they say, is the source of his present difficulties. Moreover, the president does not seem to have a clue. He compounds this mistake of his. Or is he doing it on purpose, maybe? And just pretending that he doesn't have a clue. Although Hillary might know exactly what is going on. You see, she pinned Jerry Falwell in her accusations she just came right out and just pinned Jerry Falwell. And Jerry Falwell is a Zionist, a rabid Zionist. There's no doubt about that. The Monica Lewinsky allegations, folks, arose right after Clinton refused to back Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plan. Clinton called for Israel to pull troops out of some of its territory that has been ultimately promised to Palestinian rule against Netanyahu's, the Israeli right-wing and Zionist wishes. In fact, the international Zionists are up in arms over this thing, and they are extremely angry at Clinton for this. But that's not all of it, folks. Clinton made a terrible mistake in dealing with Israel and international Zionism. He made a public statement that he thought it was unreasonable to demand that the Palestinian Liberation Organization retract its call for the, quote, destruction of the state of Israel, unquote, and urged Yasser Arafat to ignore the Israeli demand. And then, a few days later, he reiterated his call for Israel to remove troops from some of its territory. Needless to say, he made some people very angry. Some very powerful, some very wealthy people, some very crazy people who will do anything to further the interests of international Zionism and British Israelism. You see, Linda Tripp is Jewish. She's a member of the Anti-Defamation League. She is affiliated with the Mossad. She is affiliated with the United States intelligence community and was involved in an operation attempting to discredit the American militia right after the Oklahoma City bombing. Linda Tripp is a Zionist. Monica Lewinsky is Jewish. She is a Zionist. Her family is affiliated with the Anti-Defamation League, is also Zionist, and, of course, is Jewish. Ms. Lewinsky's attorney is a member of the Anti-Defamation League, is a Zionist, and he also is Jewish. Furthermore, the presence of highly classified White House documents in Monica Lewinsky's possession indicates she may be a Mossad spy. She is certainly, ladies and gentlemen, someone's spy. Kenneth Starr is an Anglophile British Israelite and also a Zionist. The entire media complex of the United States is owned by Zionists and pro-British interests. Since World War II, the Central Intelligence Agency and military intelligence communities have exercised a majority control over the press in this country. Some of the press in this country, and you would amaze, you would be absolutely amazed at how much, are proprietary Central Intelligence Agency controlled companies. Bet you didn't know they could do that, did you? Well, that's what they do all over the place. It was brought home recently by the director of the Central Intelligence Agency's defense of the CIA's policy of recruiting journalists for intelligence, and you can interpret that propaganda purposes. The CIA has traditionally been and is in the complete control of British Israelite and Zionist bureaucrats, and that is no secret within the military forces of the United States of America. 
Hillary Clinton was right on the money when she named a conspiracy, but she was off when she called it right wing, unless, of course, British Israelism, British Israelism and Zionism can be called right wing. She nailed Jerry Falwell, as he is a raving Zionist. Now, the only thing, folks, that can save Clinton from the wrath of British Israelite and Zionist wealth and power is a complete reversal of his recent policy regarding Israel. In addition, he would be required to make an apology for those statements. Now, if he does not do these things, I'll tell you right now, they'll get him. If not with Monica Lewinsky, then with something or someone else. And uh, if you want to find out how they do that, go to our webpage at harvest-trust.org and uh, go down on the front page until you find Majesty 12 and click on that. Read it. Give you an explanation on how they control politicians. That's harvest-trust.org. Then go down our homepage until you find Majesty 12. It's all run together. There's no space between Majesty and 12. And click on that and then read it. That'll tell you how politicians are controlled and why some politicians get elected and others don't. This appears, folks, to be the best explanation yet why the liberal press is crucifying the president that they have gone to so much trouble to protect all during his presidency. I mean, they've always lied for this guy. They've covered up for him. They've done everything to prevent the American people from finding out the truth about this guy and what he's done in his life. And now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they're out to get into the vengeance like sharks feeding on chum thrown in the water. For those of you who have never been fishing, chum is you catch a little fish, you chop him all up in little bitty pieces, you throw him in the water to attract some big fish and hope you catch him. <laughs> oh, yes. Isn't it amazing? Hillary Clinton, a conspiracy theorist. This is just absolutely amazing, folks. It's more than amazing. It is, uh, it's incredible. Never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> but here it is. There it was. When she did it. January the 27th. Now, in the next few days, we're going to be talking an awful lot about the right to keep and bear arms. The second article in amendment to the Constitution for the United States of America, which most people don't even know along with the other nine articles in amendment, making up the ten, or the first ten articles in amendment, known as the Bill of Rights, are actually a part and parcel of the Constitution for the United States of America. They're not something that was tacked on later. The Constitution could not and would not be adopted by the states, the first 13 states, unless they were added as an integral part of the Constitution. Most Americans don't even know that the Bill of Rights has a preamble, and the preamble spells out exactly why those 10 articles in amendment were added to the Constitution to be a part of the Constitution, because most people who print these things omit it, and they do that on purpose, along with changing the capitalization of words and inserting or taking out punctuation, which uh, should be a criminal act because they're screwing with the law. Punctuation changed the meaning of uh, the law, and so does the presence or absence of a capital letter at the beginning of a word. Those of you who don't really understand the law, you're not going to understand what I just said, uh, but maybe someday you'll get into it and, and, you know, start becoming a real people. And when you do, you'll find out what I'm talking about there. Now, the right to keep and bear arms, I don't care which side of this issue you, you claim to be on. When you get into the law, there isn't a side of the issue. Intent is everything in the law. And when you read the purpose and intent of the founding fathers, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one conclusion that can be reached. They didn't keep it any secret. They wrote extensively about the second article and amendment, the second article of the Bill of Rights. And so, 
it's very easy to discover what the intent was when the law was written. And whatever the intent was, is, and, and always will be, the, the law. And so, you can't come up, you know, 200 years later and, and uh, say that the law means something else against the intent of the people who actually wrote and passed the law. In this case, the supreme law, the law of laws. It is the United States government. And uh, anything that goes against it is not. It's subversive, as a matter of fact. Isn't it incredible how things get twisted? Wrong becomes right and right, right becomes wrong over the years. And it's all done with propaganda. If you tell people a big enough lie, often enough, they come to believe it. Because most people never, ever, ever check into anything to discover for themselves what's right and what's wrong. If they didn't learn it in school, by the time they get out of school, whatever their level of schooling was, then they're not going to go back and touch it again for the most part. Now, there are some people who certainly don't fit that mold. But uh, there are an awful lot of people who do. So, what I want to do, folks, is just take you through some opinions of, uh, of some other people. And right off the bat, I want to start with the United States Senate's report on the right to keep and bear arms. Simply because if you have it right straight from the horse's mouth, right off the bat, then it, it'll be a lot easier for you to understand what's going to come later. This is entitled, The Right to Keep and Bear Arms, a report of the Subcommittee on the Constitution of the Committee on the Judiciary, United States Senate, 97th Congress, Second Session, February 1982. It was printed for the use of the Committee on the Judiciary, United States Government Printing Office, 88-618-O, Washington, 1982. It's for sale by the Superintendent of Documents, United States Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C., 20402. So there's no excuse why you can't get your own copy and read it. It also can be accessed through many different databases on the Internet. The Committee on the Judiciary, at the time this report was written, was made up of Strom Thurmond, South Carolina, Chairman, Charles M.C.C. Mathias, Jr., Maryland, Paul Laxalt, Nevada, Orrin G. Hatch of Utah, Robert Dole, Kansas, Alan K. Simpson, Wyoming, John P. East of North Carolina, Charles E. Grassley of Iowa, Jeremiah Denton of Alabama, Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania, Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of Delaware, Edward M. Kennedy of Massachusetts, Robert C. Byrd, West Virginia, Howard M. Metzenbaum, Ohio, Dennis DeConcini, Arizona, Patrick J. Leahy, Vermont, Max Baucus, Montana, and Howell Heflin of Alabama, and uh, Vincent Devane Lead was the chief counsel. Quentin Cromelin Jr. was the staff director. The subcommittee on the Constitution was Orange G. Hatch, Utah chairman, Strom Thurmond, South Carolina, Charles E. Grassley, Iowa, Dennis D. Consini, Arizona, Patrick J. Leahy, Vermont, Stephen J. Markman, chief counsel and staff director, Randall Rader, general counsel, Peter E. Ornsby, counsel, Robert Fiedler, minority counsel. And I'm going to skip the, uh, the table of contents and go right to the preface and begin here. And if I don't finish today, we'll continue to mark as all this week is Right to Keep and Bear Arms Week. And you're going to want to take notes. You should have already copied down the source of this report so that you can get your own copy. You need ammunition to fight these liars out there who are trying to take your rights away from you. There is no people in the history of the world who have ever been disarmed, who have not shortly thereafter been enslaved or murdered. Think about that. And if you don't believe it, start your own little jaunt into history. 
And you will discover, ladies and gentlemen, that what I just told you is absolutely true. I quote from the report. To preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. End quote. Richard Henry Lee, Virginia delegate to the Continental Congress, initiator of the Declaration of Independence, and member of the First Senate which passed the Bill of Rights. Quote, The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able may have a gun. End quote. Patrick Henry in the Virginia Convention on the Ratification of the Constitution. Quote, The advantage of being armed, the Americans possess over the people of all other nations, notwithstanding the military establishments in the several kingdoms of Europe, which are carried as far as the public resources will bear, the governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. End quote. James Madison, author of the Bill of Rights, in his Federalist Paper Number 26. Quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. Second Amendment to the Constitution for the United States of America. Now this preface, ladies and gentlemen, was written by Orrin G. Hatch from Utah. He was the chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution, and he wrote this on January the 20th, 1982. I quote Orrin Hatch. In my studies as an attorney and as a United States Senator, I have constantly been amazed by the indifference or even hostility shown the Second Amendment by courts, legislatures, and commentators. James Madison would be startled to hear that his recognition of a right to keep and bear arms, which passed the House by a voice vote without objection and hardly a debate, has since been construed in but a single and most ambiguous Supreme Court decision, whereas his proposals for freedom of religion, which he made reluctantly out of fear that they would be rejected or narrowed beyond use, and those for freedom of assembly, which passed only after a lengthy and bitter debate, are the subject of scores of detailed and favorable decisions. Thomas Jefferson, who kept a veritable armory of pistols, rifles, and shotguns at Monticello, and advised his nephew to forsake other sports in favor of hunting, would be astounded to hear supposed civil libertarians claim firearm ownership should be restricted. Samuel Adams, a handgun owner who pressed for an amendment, stating that the Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms, would be shocked to hear that his native state today imposes a year's sentence without probation or parole for carrying a firearm without a police permit. Now, this is not to imply that courts have totally ignored the impact of the Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights. No fewer than 21 decisions by the courts of our state have recognized an individual right to keep and bear arms, and a majority of these have not only recognized the right, but invalidated laws or regulations which abridged it. Yet in all too many instances, courts or commentators have sought for reasons only tangentially related to constitutional history to construe this right out of existence. They argue that the Second Amendment's words, quote, right of the people, end quote, mean, quote, a right of the state, end quote, apparently overlooking the impact of those same words when used in the First and Fourth Amendments. The, quote, right of the people, end quote, to assemble or to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures is not contested as an individual guarantee, nor is it implied that they belong to the state. Still, they ignore consistency and claim that the right to, quote, bear arms, end quote, relates only to military uses. 
This not only violates a consistent constitutional reading of, quote, right of the people, end quote, but also ignores that the Second Amendment protects a right to keep arms. These commentators contend instead that the amendment's preamble regarding the necessity of a, quote, well-regulated militia to a free state, end quote, means that the right to keep and bear arms applies only to a national guard. Such a reading fails to note that the framers used the term, quote, militia, end quote, to relate to every citizen capable of bearing arms, and that Congress has established the present National Guard under its power to raise armies, expressly stating that it was not doing so under its power to organize and arm the militia. When the first Congress convened for the purpose of drafting a Bill of Rights, it delegated the task to James Madison. Madison did not write upon a blank tablet. Instead, he obtained a pamphlet listing the state proposals for a Bill of Rights and sought to produce a briefer version incorporating all the vital proposals of these. His purpose was to incorporate, not distinguish by technical changes, proposals such as that of the Pennsylvania minority, Sam Adams, or the New Hampshire delegates. Madison proposed, among other rights, quote, that right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. But no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person, end quote. In the House, this was initially modified so that the militia clause came before the proposal recognizing the right. The proposals for the Bill of Rights were then trimmed in the interests of brevity. The conscientious objector clause was removed following objections by Elbridge Gerry, who complained that future Congresses might abuse the exemption to excuse everyone from military service. The proposal finally passed the House in its present form, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. In this form, it was submitted into the Senate, which passed it the following day. The Senate, in the process, indicated its intent that the right be an individual one, for private purposes, by rejecting an amendment which would have limited the keeping and bearing of arms to bearing, quote, for the common defense, end quote. The earliest American constitutional commentators concurred in giving this broad reading to the amendment. When St. George Tucker, later Chief Justice of the Virginia Supreme Court, in 1803 published an edition of Blackstone annotated to American law, he followed Blackstone's citation of the right of the subject, quote, of having arms suitable to their condition and degree and such as are allowed by law, end quote with a citation to the Second Amendment, quote, and this without any qualification as to their condition or degree, as is the case in the British government, end quote. William Rawls' view of the Constitution, published in Philadelphia in 1825, noted that under the Second Amendment, quote, the prohibition is general. No clause in the Constitution could, by a rule of construction, be conceived to give to Congress a power to disarm the people. Such a flagitious attempt could only be made under some general pretense by a state legislature. But if in blind pursuit of inordinate power, either should attempt it, this amendment may be appealed to as restraint on both. End quote. The Jefferson Papers in the Library of Congress show that both Tucker and Rawl were friends of and corresponded with Thomas Jefferson. Their views are those of contemporaries of Jefferson, Madison, and others, and are entitled to special weight. A few years later, Joseph Story, in his Commentaries on the Constitution, considered the right to keep and bear arms as the palladium of the liberties of the Republic, which deterred tyranny and enabled the citizenry at large to overthrow it should it come to pass. 
Subsequent legislation in the Second Congress likewise supports the interpretation of the Second Amendment that creates an individual right. In the Militia Act of 1792, the Second Congress defined, quote, Militia of the United States, end quote, to include almost every free adult male in the United States. These persons were obligated by law to possess a firearm and a minimum supply of ammunition and military equipment. This statute, incidentally, remained in effect into the early years of the present century as a legal requirement of gun ownership for most of the population of the United States. There can be little doubt from this that when the Congress and the people spoke of a militia, they had reference to the traditional concept of the entire populace capable of bearing arms and not to any formal group such as what is today called the National Guard. The purpose was to create an armed citizenry, which the political theorists at the time considered essential to ward off tyranny. From this militia, appropriate measures might create a well-regulated militia of individuals trained in their duties and responsibilities as citizens and owners of firearms. If gun laws, in fact, worked, the sponsors of this type of legislation should have no difficulty drawing upon long lists of examples of crime rates reduced by such legislation. That they cannot do so after a century and a half of trying, that they must sweep under the rug the southern attempts at gun control in the 1870 to 1910 period, the northeastern attempts in the 1920 to 1939 period, the attempts at both federal and state levels in 1965 to 1976 establishes the repeated, complete, and inevitable failure of gun laws to control serious crime. Immediately upon assuming chairmanship of the subcommittee on the Constitution, I sponsored the report which follows as an effort to study, rather than ignore, the history of the controversy over the right to keep and bear arms. Utilizing the research capabilities of the Subcommittee on the Constitution, the resources of the Library of Congress, and the assistance of constitutional scholars such as Mary Karen Jolly, Stephen Halbrook, and David T. Hardy, the Subcommittee has managed to uncover information on the right to keep and bear arms, which documents quite clearly its status as a major individual right of American citizens. We did not guess at the purpose of the British 1689 Declaration of Rights, we located the journals of the House of Commons and private notes of the Declaration's sponsors now dead for two centuries. We did not make suppositions as to colonial interpretations of that Declaration's right to keep arms. We examined colonial newspapers which discussed it. We did not speculate as to the intent of the framers of the Second Amendment. We examined James Madison's drafts for it, his handwritten outlines of speeches upon the Bill of Rights, and discussions of the Second Amendment by early scholars who were personal friends of Madison, Jefferson, and Washington, and wrote while these still lived. What the subcommittee on the Constitution uncovered was clear and long lost. Proof that the Second Amendment to our Constitution was intended as an individual right of the American citizen to keep and carry arms in a peaceful manner for protection of himself, his family, and his freedoms. The summary of our research and findings forms the first portion of this report. In the interest of fairness and the presentation of a complete picture, we also invited groups which were likely to oppose this recognition of freedoms to submit their views. The statements of two associations who replied are reproduced here following the report of the subcommittee. The subcommittee also invited statements by Messrs. Halbrook and Hardy and by the National Rifle Association, whose statements likewise follow our report. When I became chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution, I hoped that I would be able to assist in the protection of the constitutional rights of American citizens, rights which have too often been eroded in the belief that government could be relied upon for quick solutions to difficult problems. Both as an American citizen 
and as a United States Senator, I repudiate this view. I likewise repudiate the approach of those who believe to solve American problems you simply become something other than American. To my mind, the uniqueness of our free institutions, the fact that an American citizen can boast freedoms unknown in any other land, is all the more reason to resist any erosion of our individual rights. When our ancestors forged a land conceived in liberty, they did so with musket and rifle. When they reacted to attempts to dissolve their free institutions and establish their identity as a free nation, they did so as a nation of armed free men. When they sought to record forever a guarantee of their rights, they devoted one full amendment out of ten to nothing but the protection of their right to keep and bear arms against government interference. Under my chairmanship, the subcommittee on the Constitution will concern itself with a proper recognition of and respect for this right most valued by free men. Signed, Orrin G. Hatch, Chairman, Subcommittee on the Constitution, January 20th, 1982. Isn't it funny, ladies and gentlemen, that when a group of men got together in Montana and called themselves free men, <laughs> The American people thought they were some kind of wackos. This country was founded by free men. The title Freeman was passed on to the posterity of the founding fathers so that men could be and would be free men in this country forever. And that if anyone attempted ever to change that, they wrote a guarantee in the Constitution for the United States of America, recognizing the right of the people to keep and bear arms, to use against their own government, should that government become oppressive or become tyrannical in their application of government toward the people. They wrote a Constitution and a Bill of Rights as a contract between the states and the federal government which they created. They gave to this federal government some very, very small and very limited powers. They restricted the federal government, ladies and gentlemen. And they gave to the states or to the people all other powers not specifically prohibited by the Constitution nor reserved for the federal government. If the states fail to take those powers and prohibit them to the people, then the powers pass from the states to the people and remain in the hands of the people. This government, this constitutional Republican government, not this democracy that you hear everybody expounding upon all across the land, and whenever you hear them use that term, you know you're listening to an idiot who knows absolutely nothing about the United States of America. This constitutional republic was founded by, of, for the people. This government is, always has been, and always will be, the people. If anybody takes issues with that and attempts to wrest government from the hands of the people and attempts to enslave the people of the United States of America, or if they attempt just simply and slowly as they are doing now to erode and take away the individual creator-endowed rights recognized by our founding fathers and protected by the Constitution, the supreme law of the United States of America, then the people have the right, not just the right, but the duty to take up arms, to oppose that tyranny, and to restore constitutional Republican government to the hands of the people 
of the United States of America. These are the issues that we will touch upon and cover thoroughly during this week of broadcasts on the hour of the time. And folks, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want to miss it. You've heard some names mentioned by Orrin Hatch in his preface to this Senate report, which we'll get into tomorrow. And we're going to also read what those gentlemen wrote about the second article and amendment, and a lot more. And folks, we may even go into an additional week. It's about time the American people started being American people. And the first thing that you have to do to become a real American citizen is to become educated. You cannot be an American citizen if you are ignorant. You cannot be an American citizen if you don't even know what that means. You cannot be an American citizen if you have not read the writings of the Founding Fathers. Because if you haven't read those writings, then you have no idea what their intention was. Why they wrote what they wrote. Why the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are what they are. Why they even went to war against England to found this country. If you don't know those things, you cannot call yourself an American. If you don't own a copy of the Constitution for the United States of America, you have no understanding of this government, what it is, what it's restricted to, and what powers it has. You have no idea what powers you have or your state has. You have no idea what your rights are and how they are protected by the Constitution for the United States of America and the Bill of Rights. And unless you read the amendments that were made subsequent to the passage of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, you have no idea how they may have been changed and eroded or, in some cases, strengthened. If you don't possess, if you don't own a copy of the Constitution for the United States of America, if you don't understand it and you can't quote from memory what's in it, there is no way in the world, ladies and gentlemen, that you can call yourself an American citizen. At best, you're just an ignorant person stumbling around, bumping into trees and wondering why. How'd that get there? I never saw it before. Or you're one of these people who are always spouting off about your constitutional rights when you don't even know what they are. Never read the Constitution in your life and don't even understand that you don't have any constitutional rights. You have creator-endowed rights recognized and protected by the Constitution for the United States of America, the Bill of Rights, and the amendments thereto. If you don't know those things, you are a slave to whoever knows enough to convince you what to think about what you have or what you don't have. The first step in your education in the right direction, ladies and gentlemen, is to turn off your television set and leave it off. If you really want to know the truth about the television set and what you should do with it, if you have a small child around two years or three years old, give that child a hammer and give that child your television set and tell him to play with it for a couple of hours. Leave the child alone. When the child gets finished with that television set, you will be better off. You will be richer in spirit. And probably for the first time in your life, your family will sit down and talk to each other instead of sitting down in silence staring at the screen of the great brainwashing machine of the socialist, totalitarian world government that is coming. <laughs> Think I'm kind of tough on you? Well, somebody's got to be, folks. We're running out of time. You see, there just isn't any time left to sit down and tell you that you're all sweet, wonderful, great people, and, and you're so intelligent, and you have this great education, and you're all Americans, so you can't be bad and all that kind of stuff because it just isn't true. In fact, that's pablum gobbledygook that people have been feeding you that's led you into the stupor in which you find yourselves now. 
What you really need, most of you, what you really need to jar you out of your apathy, your complacency, and your ignorance is for somebody to come up with a two-by-four and just smack you upside the head as hard as they can to get your attention. So, since I can't go around smacking you with a two-by-four, I smack you with words through the airwaves, hoping that it will make you mad enough to get up off your butt and go to the library or go to the U.S. government printing office or go to a federal repository and just try to prove me wrong. Just try. If you can, and you can present me with the documentation, the sources and the proof that I am wrong, I will come on the air and I will correct whatever it is that is wrong and apologize for it. However, <clears throat> what's bound to happen, and every once in a while somebody does find that I've said or uh, researched something and arrived at the wrong outcome. And so I have made some apologies over the air, folks. I'm human just like the rest of you, but I'm doing a lot more than most of you ever have or ever will for freedom for this country. Certainly a lot more than I did when I went off to Vietnam thinking I was fighting for my country. <laughs> that was a fool's game. Now I'm in my country, really fighting for my country. Mostly what you will discover is that I am right. And when you discover that, you will become an ally in this battle. You see, we are already engaged in World War III, ladies and gentlemen. And our freedom hangs in the outcome. For the most part, it's an information war. You're being bombarded with lies, deceptions, misinformation, erroneous beliefs. And because there's so much of it, most of you don't even know how to find out what's true anymore. So you pick somebody that sounds like they're telling the truth and you just blindly believe in them. That's the road to perdition. I want to put it another way, it's the road straight to hell. Good night, folks. God bless each and every single one of you. And I mean that from way down deep within my heart. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there's a loud knock on your door. Hey, honey. Something's not right. Step on past me. We're here for the government. We're here to help you. And I'm from the IRS with a power to tax. Did you die from free? Stay in the back. Get out of this house. Surrender your guns. Give me your gold. You may obey the right of gold. Answer this guy and do what you're told. Hillary Salala, Reno Janet Dyke, reading the words of General Albert Pike, the money founder of the Ku Klux Klan, engineer of the Masonic Master Plan. Pike said, Lucifer is God across the land. And Clinton saying, take the mark in your right hand. Well, we're all dancing to the drums of up world right. Clinton's preparing it for another huge pack. Hide. Order. Order out of chaos, depression, inflation, and create the panic and rape the nation. Order. Crisis creation. Incite black and white program agitation. Don't miss this. Here's the rumor. By the UN and white world, the ATF prevented blacks from the one world order. But it's not new. Iron Mountain, Computer Beasts, and Cattle Mutilations. Black Projects, UFOs, and weird genetic combinations. The Nazi doctors didn't die? Come on, get him. They came here with the OSS through Operation Paperclip. National ID, debit card? Yeah. Vaccination biochip, milk carton kits, genetic engineering. Clinton says her health plans for you and your own good. 
Sure. And then I'll hit the Robin Hood. The Sonic Mind Manipulation. Inciting riots is crisis creation. You're listening to 101.1 FM Eager. Classic radio like you always wished it could be.